Well, we come to the point when we're going to turn to the Bible uh, and read these inspired words concerning our Lord Jesus Christ in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. Mark 2 and the first 12 verses. And when he and when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Amen. May God's Word uh, touch our hearts today. Well, I don't think there's too much doubt about what our subject is this morning uh, from our reading. It's mentioned a number of times It is about uh, the authority of Christ to forgive sins. Uh, You won't hear this message anywhere else uh, in our world today. Uh, It's not high on the agenda. It's not on the headlines of the newspapers. But it's the most wonderful thing to hear about, that there is the possibility of forgiveness from God for us. And that's this morning's about. That's what we're going to announce and try and explain from this passage. Now, as Johnny was saying, the whole idea of Christ's authority in general has been building up so far in Mark. Uh, We we learned about the authority that he had over this demon-possessed man earlier on in chapter 1. I mean, if you think about that, and if you look back on it, you know, this this demonic uh, personality uh, was able to, to cause this, this man to have a seizure, several seizures probably, and yet Christ was able to speak to the, the power uh, of the demon and to, and to cast that demon out of the man. He had the authority to do that. We've also learned something about the authority of Christ over disease. I mean, it's a marvelously atmospheric scene earlier on in chapter 1 there. Go back and look at it when, as the sun is dipping down, the sun is setting, uh, the house where Christ is staying, they bring all the people who are demon-possessed, myriad diseases, and he is able to cast out not just demons, but also to heal the diseases that people have. He had authority to do that. That's why they said... Uh, back in verse 27, here is a new teaching, a new teaching that has authority. I mean, they looked at the professional clerics of the day, uh, the academics, you know, and the way they taught things and how it came across. And, you know, they referenced this Pharisee and that scribe. And, uh, you know, they looked up the references and they quoted this thing. And, you know, and it just didn't come across with any sense of authority. And probably because they knew their lifestyles and the hypocrisy of these people. It carried no weight, no authority at all. But they looked at Christ, 
and who he was as well as what he did and said and he said this, this is completely different there, there's a real sense of authority that comes over it now all of these are almost just kind of preliminary statements that lead us up to this point and the point that we're at is the biggest of all which is that there is authority also to forgive sins now physical illness of course is a terrible thing you know if you if you know someone who's got authority to help you in a physical illness I mean that that makes a big difference I mean I spoke to somebody just on Friday actually um, who was telling me it's more than 10 years ago since she had been treated for her breast cancer and she, she's doing well now if she lived in another country in the world and if she lived 50 years ago that would have been quite a different story but there are now people who have the ability you know to help in a whole variety of situations wonderful to have that kind of ability now physical illness is one thing I mean you take this man's paralysis the man in the story I mean this man couldn't do anything to help himself he couldn't dress himself he couldn't feed himself he couldn't attend to basic everyday necessities he was totally dependent on his friends if he hadn't got any friends like the four men that we read about here he would he would have been totally lost could have done nothing at all his paralysis was total and it was terrible but the thing is if you read the way that this passage unfolds what becomes evident is this that initially as a priority as the first thing that Jesus said and did for this man was the fact that he did not heal him. He does eventually, but the very first thing that he says to this man is your sins are forgiven. That was the more important thing of all. You know, the thing is this, that um, these incidents that we read in the narrative of the life of Christ, they, 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 they're not just haphazard. They're, they're not just put here sporadically. Um, they're, they're here for a reason. I mean, the point was made last week uh, about the man who had leprosy that Jesus healed. And the fact that leprosy is frequently used as a picture and an analogy of our deeper spiritual need, our sins before God. The fact that it's described as an uncleanness that needs to be cleansed. The fact that it isolated people um, as, as far as general society was concerned, and that isol sin isolates us from God. Well, paralysis, this man's paralysis, it's, it's an object lesson for us. It's a picture to convey a truth to us today about a deeper spiritual disease. Deeper spiritual disease. Sin that corrupts, that spreads that affects us, that, that can paralyze us as far as any ability to reach for God or to achieve happiness and satisfaction in life. Sin is a spiritual paralysis. And we can't lift a finger. You know, it's almost as if we want to do it and yet the hand won't move, it won't respond. There is a spiritual paralysis as far as our ability to rescue our own situation or to turn it around. The greatest need of all being our standing before God. And so this, this incident, it serves as a, as a message to us about the nature of sin and how sin can be forgiven by Christ. Sin, sin is a root problem in our life. It's, uh, it's not just a symptom. It's the root problem. It's something that we're all born with. We're, we're born in sin. And sin is ultimately, although it does affect people, it's, it's, against, it's against God. David said that. Just broken my glasses by fiddling around with them. David said that. Um, 
he, he committed a great sin against uh, a woman and her husband. And yet in his prayer of repentance and confession, he said, it's against you, God. You only have I sinned and have done this evil uh, in your sight. So sin is a root problem that is part of our life that we have inherited ultimately, not just from our parents and our grandparents, but from Adam, our very first parent. And it's carried on as part of what it means to be a human being. This inbuilt, ingrained tendency to live for ourselves and to disregard the law of God, the Bible, Christ, God's principles. And that ultimately is the cause of so many of the problems in our world. Ultimately, at the heart of it all, it is the cause of disease. It is the cause of disaster. It is the cause, eventually, of death. And, and sin can be thought of in a number of ways, and it's explained in a number of ways in the Bible. In this context here, it can be understood in terms of debt. Debt. Now, we, we all know about debt. In the same way that an individual might find themselves having, you know, racked up debt over the years because of how they've used their credit cards or they've, they've spent just too much or, you know, the national debt that we've, we've been learning about or gambling or whatever. You know, we, we know about debt and how, how people can be just totally overwhelmed by, by financial debt. Well, that's the way in which this has been, been explained here because at the root of the meaning of the word forgiveness is the idea of the cancelling of debt. Now, all of us over the years have accumulated spiritual debt. Debt that's owed to God. Every, every sin that we commit, every lie that we tell, every untruth, every unkind action, every act of treachery, everything that we've done that's hidden from the majority is known by God and is a debt that is held against us. And, and that debt, that debt that all of us have, we will have to we will have to answer for. And that debt, I cannot pay that, and neither can you. I cannot absolve myself from my debt of sin against God. And that's where this wonderful message comes in here about forgiveness, about the cancelling of spiritual debt by Christ. That's the whole point of this passage. How can debt, spiritual debt, be cancelled? How can sin be forgiven? Now, I've been talking about sin, but you know as well as I do that that's something that is not popular at all in our day and age. And in many senses, it's something that is explained away and is explained in other terms. And because it's explained in other terms, it's, it's denied. It's, it's, it's self-denial. We talk about things um, as being a psychological problem. And uh, we almost medicalize certain things. Or, or we, we explain things in terms of social ills. And, and that is the explanation that we present. The Bible is quite clear, it's so helpful, it's so crucial for us to, to, to boil it all down, right down to the absolute explanation. And the problem is there is sin. Sin against God, a debt against God. Now, not only do we try and explain this all away and deny it, but organized religion has obscured this. Because there is such a thing as religion that's not true to the Bible. You know, just traditions that have grown up and, and just really cause things to be 
so woolly and, and muddy. How's that for a mixed metaphor? Woolly and muddy at the same time. And confuse the whole thing. You know, so for instance, you will get churches that will teach that uh, if you go to a man in a little booth separated with a wee partition, speak through the wee window, that that man will absolve you of your sins. I absolve you of your sin. A man able to, a woman able to forgive sins. The point about this passage is Christ alone has authority on earth to forgive sins. People lying on their deathbeds, on a battlefield, whatever, a chaplain comes up to them, fiddles in his little rucksack, and gives to them the last rites to absolve you from your sins before you die and go out to meet God. Ridiculous to think that anything like that could possibly be the case. Maybe near our home, the fact that we, f- we think that if we just continue to, to do our best and tally things up and outweigh the good with the bad and be the best that I can and give to charity and be kind, yet that somehow or another that makes me acceptable. What does that do about all the sins that I've committed in my life? Does that absolve them? Does that wash them away? Does that get rid of all these things that I did and the things that I should have done and I never did? No, no, no. But yet these are the ways that people try to explain it away and and think about it. And it's a kind of replacement theology, if you like, that tries to confuse what Scripture is really teaching. And what is he saying? Verse 10 is our, our main verse, of course. The Son of Man has authority. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, this was a favorite title that Jesus had. He mainly just used that of himself. You hardly hear any of his disciples or anybody else using that title. He used that of himself. The Son of Man has authority. And there's two things tied up with it. One is that he was a man. He was, he was deity. He was the God of heaven and earth. Yet he became a man. He was the, the, the son of man, the ultimate man. But he was a man. But his deity is tied up with that as well. Those of you who want to check this one out, you go back and read the book of Daniel chapter 7. Very key passage where God, the ancient of days, as he's titled, is pictured. And somebody comes to him in the clouds of heaven and approaches the court of the Ancient of Days and is given all authority and kingdom and power. And that person is described as the Son of Man. It's a messianic title pointing forward to the coming of Christ. And he takes this and he uses it and he applies it. And the people, particularly the scribes and the Pharisees, they know very well what he's driving at. He's making a claim. He's taking that title from Daniel 7 and he's making it his own. I am the son of man who approaches the ancient of days. And so we have that here as he talks about who he is, his his own identity. But but tied in here is, is the importance, not just of Christ's identity, the fact that he is so unique, and so majestic, and so great. But, but his death upon the cross at Calvary is here too. Now, now for me, this, this stands out as an enormously powerful point. Because um, what he says here is, you know, what, what's easier for me to say? Is it easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier for me to say, rise up and walk? Because, you see, the Pharisees, the critics had been saying, it's all very well for him to make this pronouncement today. It's all very well for him to say, take up your bed and walk to the paralyzed man who's lying on that mat. I mean, I mean who's going to know any difference? I mean, how, how would you know? If his sins were forgiven, he's not going to change color or anything. You would have no idea if it's true 
or if it's not, that is a very easy thing to do. Anybody could do that. Anybody could say that. It would be a different thing altogether if you were to say or try to say to him, rise up and walk. Because if that didn't happen, then everything's blown up. You know whether the person's a charlatan or whether they're true. That would have been a hard thing to do. Are you, are you prepared to take that risk? Are you prepared to try and say that to the person? Now, of course, eventually Jesus does heal the man. He does say to him, and the man does get up, and he takes his mat, and he goes home, and he, he does reveal that he has got authority to heal But Jesus said, nevertheless, I want you to think about this. He said, the harder thing to say, the much, much more difficult thing for me to say today is your sins are forgiven. That's harder than the other. Now, why is that? Well, the reason that is the case is that Jesus knew what was involved, what would be involved for him in saying these words. How can forgiveness be offered to anybody? How could the cancelling of my spiritual debt before God ever conceivably happen? Well, there's only one way that that could happen. The The only way that that could take place was if Christ died for our sin. It's about Calvary, this. It's about the cross. It's about the suffering of the Son of God upon the cross of Calvary. That's why it was such a difficult thing for him to say that. I mean, he knew what was involved. That's why in Gethsemane he he wept and he sweat drops of blood in his intensity as he thought about what was going to happen the next day. That's why he cried out upon the cross as the darkness descended, a darkness that wasn't just physical, although that was the case, but it was a darkness of the soul. And a cry of, you know, the best word I think I've ever heard to describe it is the word dereliction. A cry of dereliction from the cross. Why have you forsaken me? Why have I been abandoned? What is happening to me here? Well, I'll tell you what was happening. In the words of Isaiah 53, God made to meet upon him the iniquity of us all. The one who was just was dying for the sakes of of us who are unjust so that he might bring us to God. He is paying a debt that he did not owe. He never committed one sin, the sinless, pure Son of the Highest. In all his perfection, in his love, he personally pays the spiritual debt by being abandoned by God upon the cross and the wrath of God being poured out upon him. That was a difficult thing. There was nothing harder than that. And that's why he said these words. And we need to come to Christ for forgiveness. As we think back over our lives, and all our failures, misgivings, and shortcomings, we need to come to Christ because he is the only one the only one who has authority and ability and power to forgive, to absolutely wipe clean our sins. He's taken them, all our sins and all our sorrows, and he made them his very own on Calvary. And he paid that debt, and he became accountable so that our sins can go and can be cancelled. You know, that's why these people went to such great lengths on this occasion. They knew, and of course, they were mainly thinking about the man's paralysis, but they knew that the only hope for their friend 
was in taking him to Christ. No, nothing else would do. I mean, that's, that's why they went up on the roof. That's why they were so, so urgent, so strenuous, ripping up the, the roof, the tiles, you know, the plaster work, knocking the big hole. You must, must have been some scene with all the plaster work falling down on the crowds round about Christ as he's teaching them. And the man is lowered through the hole, right down before Christ. I mean, why did they go to these lengths? Well, the reason they went to those lengths was that they knew that there was no other hope for their friend. The only hope was in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I wonder again if we have really grasped that point, the urgency of coming to Christ Jesus said on one occasion, you need to make every effort to enter in at the narrow gate. You know, whatever you do, make sure you get in that gate. Make every effort to enter in. Seek you first the kingdom of God and seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. I wonder if this sense of priority for ourselves and maybe for our friends, as these people did for their friends, should grip us. And and we all speak to our own hearts. The greatest demonstration of friendship that I can show to somebody is to bring them to Christ. To tell them about Christ, the one who can forgive sins. I want you to look at their faith. It's an interesting statement, isn't it, there, where it says in verse 5 that when Jesus saw their faith, there was four men, maybe each on a corner, and the man who's lying there, when Jesus saw their faith. Now, It's not that I can have faith on behalf of somebody else. Of course, when he said their faith, he acknowledged that the four men had faith, the friends, but the man on the bed also had faith. It was all of them. And, you know, I can't can't expect somebody else to have faith for me, my parents or grandparents or whatever. You know, it doesn't run in the blood like that. It it doesn't happen by osmosis. I, I need to have personal, individual faith you know, to look, look at Christ and his death upon the cross and to, and to believe that, to believe in him, to, to trust and to say, you know, nowhere else I can go, nowhere else I can achieve forgiveness. I must come to Christ and embrace him so that my sins are taken away. Faith is what was required. I was thinking of an old hymn, a verse of an old hymn. You might have to concentrate on this. And uh, the word is this. Payment God will not twice demand. First at my bleeding surety's hand. And then again at mine. You know what a surety is? A surety is a guarantor. A surety is somebody who stands good for somebody else. Do you have a surety? Someone who stood good for you, stood in your place. And what that old hymn is saying is this. You know, God will not twice demand payment. You know, if, if, if I have had faith in Christ, all that Christ is and has done has been put to my account. And I will never have to stand accountable for that again. Payment God will not twice demand. First at my bleeding surety's hand. And then again at mine. Now that's a wonderful thing to know. That my sin can be forgiven. And maybe there's somebody here that for the very first time needs to come to Christ. And receive his forgiveness. And the cancelling of your debt by personal faith 
in him. And for those of us who are believers, again, to, to re-embrace and almost rediscover the, the wonder and the amazement of, of the reality of this tremendous thing called the forgiveness of sins. Of course, that's what we're going to do tonight. Let me again encourage you to come as we have the opportunity to give Christ thanks for his body given for us and for his blood that was shed. So how does the whole thing end? Well, it ends with a, a hole in the wall, the hole in the wall gang, hole, hole in the ceiling. It ends with a man walking out. Um, and it ends with amazement from the crowd. See that? They were all amazed. This is a kind of repeating theme. They were all amazed and they, and they glorified God saying, you know, we, we've never seen anything like this. Never in our lives have we seen anything like what we've seen today. This is an absolutely remarkable thing that we have been witnesses to today. You know, there is the tendency, isn't there? If, if this is our routine on a Sunday morning to come to a place like this, that, you know, we can lose that sense of wonder and amazement. And we don't stand amazed in the presence of Christ at all. We think, well, okay, fair enough. And, you know, it all, it all just seems a bit almost normal and, and, and can become almost bland and repetitive. I mean, what we need to get back to is, is what these people had on that day as we've heard this. The amazement of the reality of, of sins forgiven. Now, just one point, and I'm taking you right back to the first verse. This took place in a house. Actually, if you look at it, it says in verse 1, where Christ was at home. This might, this might have been Christ's own house in this town called Capernaum. Capernaum, which came to be known as his own town. Later on, Jesus spoke about his own town. I think it's Matthew 12, you read these words. And he said this, Capernaum, O Capernaum, you who have been exalted to heaven will be cast down to hell. I mean, what did he mean? But what, he went on to say this, if the mighty works that had been done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented and, and you remained hard. And you didn't believe. And because of all your privilege, you're held all the more responsible. I mean, that's a salutary note, isn't it? That is something for us to consider. With all our privileges of having the Bible and hearing it read and hearing it taught, the people of Capernaum remained hard. We need to have this sense of amazement. Now, as I close, there, there's just one last thing I want to say, and it's this to Christians. That the greatest proof of all that a person has genuinely been forgiven, that a person has experienced the forgiveness of their sin before God, is that they too forgive other people. Remember in the Lord's Prayer that we've all said over the years, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now what that's really meaning is this. If, if I don't show forgiveness to others, Chances are that I have never really experienced forgiveness myself. Because, because my debt has been enormous before God. And if I understood how great that debt was that I had been forgiven, the paltry sum that somebody else owes me, <laughs> you know, I should be forgiving that. And so that is the proof if I still harbor resentment against somebody, and maybe there is somebody that you think about just now, you've never forgiven them. You've held it against them. 
something you can't get over and you haven't let go, you need to address that. You need to think about these words. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now shall we pray. Lord, for for the wonderful person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching and his death, we give thanks. The fantastic reality that there is forgiveness with Christ for our sins. And so we make our prayer today that this wonderful message might grip our hearts, that we all might have a sense of amazement as we think about what Christ has done and help us to act upon that with faith. We commit ourselves to you as we give our thanks in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen.